So good morning everyone. My name is Nitish and uh, Sawadikap. That's how you say, that's how you greet in Thai. So that was one of my friends who told me. And today I'll be talking to you about uh, some of the issues that we found in a service that is called Azure Machine Learning Service. That's like a cloud-based machine learning as a service offering from Microsoft. So a little about myself. Uh, I'm from Sekim. It's a small state in India. I work at Trend Micro with a focus on cloud and container threat research. So recently I ranked uh, 75th on the Microsoft MSRC MBR 2023. So that's a year for me. And I've been in the uh, threat research uh, space for around uh, two and a half years now. So I have some experience with uh, security operations, threat hunting, uh, vulnerability disclosures and stuff. So I'm also a member of uh, NULL, which is an open security community. It's all across the globe. So you can find me on uh, this website and I wrote my uh, first song in 2018 uh, but my first exploit in 2009. So the exploit was related to a game called uh, cheat, uh, a game called Spider Solitaire. So I was able to modify the number of steps using uh, another tool that is called Cheat Engine. So yeah, that was 2009 and yeah, so that's my Twitter. And yeah, this is a picture of me where I went on a trek with a friend, with like, with a couple of friends of mine. And I trekked for around like four kilometers with a minor ACL tier. So yeah, that's about me. So now on the journey, uh, we'll be exploring this iceberg of Azure Machine Learning Service in the form of few chapters or I would like to call it like episodes. So we'll go through some introduction of what we are going to uh, talk about the issues that we uncovered in the cloud-based service like throughout our journey, a uh, few angles of research that we tried and we learned. It's not cool to call it, I mean, it is cool to call it a failure, but we learned along the way. Uh, so, and finally, we'll uh, wrap things up. So, just a disclaimer. Uh, so, I'm not affiliated to the Zero Day Initiative. It's a part of Trend Micro, and I'm a part of Trend Micro Research. So this is a talk about the security issues that we found in the hottest machine learning as a service platform currently and now we begin the journey. So there has been some buzz around cloud service providers fixing vulnerabilities reported in Jupyter notebook based services like be it Azure, be it AWS, be it GCP. So is there something off or something fishy with Jupyter notebooks in general? So I pack my bags and I head to the Azure portal and I search for services that are based on Jupyter. And I'm greeted by this one interesting result which talks about running some Jupyter notebooks in a workspace. It's Azure Machine Learning and this is where it all started. So in 2019, I know that you guys are not a fan of uh, Gartner reports, but yeah. So in 2019, there was a prediction that by 2023, the usage of cloud-based machine learning systems would go up by five times. And uh, in 2023, it kind of makes sense as companies are seeking to use AI in their products and services to create chat GPT like chatbots to train LLMs on their own custom data sets. And uh, when chat GPT was released, uh, probably everyone was curious to know how does the underlying platform, like how does it look? And uh, this video clip, uh, from, okay, uh, the, the video clip from May this year makes kind of sense now. So what is Azure Machine Learning? Uh, okay, so we have a bunch of services here and if you see on the bottom most we have the ML platform which is Azure Machine Learning. So if you're using any of the services that are applied AI services or cognitive services, they probably use Azure Machine Learning somewhere. So uh, we'll go through some basics first because Azure Machine Learning is a mammoth of a service and uh, from the other talks that I have been to at Hack in the Box as of now, uh, this might be a new thing, so I'll just uh, keep it very simple. So Azure Machine Learning is a service and from a service you create a resource. And uh, uh, Azure Machine Learning, it uses a mix of user managed and Microsoft managed services to function. In AML, Azure Machine Learning, you will basically create a workspace which is like a centralized place to manage all your uh, machine learning activities and artifacts. So you can access a workspace using a browser, VS Code, the Azure ML API, the SDK, and others, uh, yeah, so these are the tools. So uh, what do you do on a workspace? You basically work. You create Jupyter Notebooks, run experiments, create or import datasets, 
create a training or inference environments you can deploy your machine learning models that you have trained as endpoints so you can do your entire like ml ops just from the browser itself so the workspace is dependent on certain Azure services on the user's end. So when you create a workspace, the resources for these services are either created or you can just specify the existing resource that you have. So you have storage accounts, uh, key vaults, container registry and app insights. So uh, when you create a workspace, you should like, I mean, it's not uh, like mandatory to have a container registry already configured. So all of these services have their own uh, reasons for exi for existence and for usage in workspace. So uh, I'll just go through uh, key vaults and app insights. Yeah. So key vaults basically you store your secrets, your tokens in a key vault, and application insights are basically to uh, monitor your deployed machine learning models. So like if they are performing f uh, fine or not. Container registries are to keep your uh, specific environment uh, configurations in the form of container images and we'll go through storage account in a bit. So in AML, uh, data scientists or general users, they would perform ML ops. And these are the various compute targets that are provided by AML for user to run Jupyter Notebooks, training scripts, or they can also host uh, ML models as endpoints. So you have a compute cluster. So the cluster can be, so yeah, the compute cluster is a managed cluster of VMs. So it has like multi-node scaling capability and it is like GPU enabled as well. So Kubernetes clusters are existing Kubernetes clusters that you already have in your Azure account. It can, it is based on AKS or you can have your on-premise uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster as well. The attached compute, uh, you can attach uh, VMs and you can run your training jobs on the VM. Uh, you have Databricks, uh, you have HD inside resources as well. So for this talk, uh, specifically, we'll be talking about compute instances. So compute instance is a managed Ubuntu based virtual machine that resides in a Microsoft subscription. And by managed, we mean that the resources are maintained uh, by Microsoft, like patching of the host OS or patching of any issues if they are found in the compute instance. The OS image contains various other tools that are used by developers. It's a development environment, such as uh, Jupyter, VS Code, Docker, Python, and all of these other stuff. So this is where you basically run your code and you can perform your model training. Each workspace has a storage account which contains your machine learning related entities. So like you need to, uh, like you can keep your Jupyter notebooks, data sets, models, and all of these other things in a storage account. And to access a storage account, there is something that is called a data store. So data stores are basically a reference to a workspace's storage account. And you can use data stores to basically uh, avoid uh, storing access keys or SAS credentials in your scripts. You can simply refer using the data store and you can like access the file share or the blob storage. So the file shares and the blob storage, like the blob containers, they are used to store your notebooks, data sets, logs and models. So this is basically where you store your stuff and compute instances, compute targets, that is where you run your stuff. So you can browse the, uh, yeah, you can browse the storage account using Storage Explorer and you can view the file shares and the blob containers that are referenced by some default data stores that are created when you create, a, uh, create an AML workspace. So this is how it looks like. So uh, yeah, so here we have, so, yeah, so here we have a data store that is named, let's say, workspace working directory that is mapped uh, to a file share that starts with code and, uh, and a random UUID. And the data store type is of Azure file share. And similarly, we have something for Azure blob storage as well. So data stores in Azure machine learning, they support a credential based authentication for file shares. So when you talk of credential based uh, authentication, that basically means a username and a password combination is used where the username is the storage account name and the password is the storage account's primary access key. Additionally, multiple users can create compute instances in a workspace. And by design, there cannot be two owners for a compute instance. So it's like a one-to-one -one mapping. And uh, by design, any user can access other users file share because the common file share is mounted across all the compute instance. And all of this is by design. There's no vulnerability here. The common Azure file share is mounted and yeah. 
So with this uh, basic introduction of Azure Machine Learning Service, we will begin with the first chapter. That is, our data scientist is looking for their keys. So did you see my keys? While examining the different folders and the files that are uh, existing on a compute instance, when you create a compute instance, we come across a directory structure which looks something like this. So this directory structure is of Azure Batch, which is another service. So we take a quick look into what Azure Batch is. Using Batch, you can basically run your large scale workloads in Azure with auto scaling and monitoring as well. So for example, if you want to uh, process images at scale, by distributing the workload you will uh, in Azure, then you will probably go for Azure Batch. So these are some basic terms to understand as we proceed. So remember, it's a journey and not all pauses are very beautiful, I would say. So we have something that is called a node. So nodes are basically virtual machines that are based on uh, Linux or Windows. A, a group of nodes is called a pool. Uh, so that's for pools. Uh, a job is basically a collection of tasks. So let's say you want to run a script uh, 10 times to figure out if your performance or if your metrics are changing for each run, then you use uh, a job. And a task is basically an individual run of a job. So basically one single run of the script. Or you can just think of tasks as um, a, way, a way to run commands on the computes. Yeah. So in batch, you have a concept of start task. It's similar to the startup task. I mean, the startup uh, thing that we have for Windows. So the start task runs when node starts up. And the uh, files that are required or the logs that are generated, they are uh, stored in this path highlighted in blue. So it's mount batch tasks startup. So the output of the start task based on the errors or this, just the standard output, they are stored in these two files that are standard error and standard out dot text. So as we saw previously, the file share is mounted on a compute instance. So we had a question. Since uh, it, since Azure file shares and data stores, they use credential-based authentication. That means a combination of the username, that is the storage account's name, and the password, that is the storage account's primary access key. We were curious to know uh, how does this uh, mounting happen? We found a couple of commands that were being logged in the error logs. So the output of the start task is logged in the uh, standard out and standard error. And in the standard error logs, we found the username and the password, like basically the storage account name and the storage account credential, like the primary access key, in the error logs. And since this command is being run as sudo, the commands also get logged in the authorization logs. So uh, we reported these instances to Microsoft and we waited. Few days later, we came across an instance where the password field was masked. Note that the uh, commands that are executed in the start task, they are created by Microsoft. So like Microsoft writes those commands and they are run on the compute instance. So this was the fix. And that left us wondering like, what if there are more such instances of credentials being logged or stored in clear text? Hence, we started looking for more such occurrences on the compute instance. So Azure Machine Learning uses certain agents to manage compute instances. So by managing, you mean uh, diagnosing or monitoring and making sure that the compute instance is healthy, etc. So these agents are installed on all compute instances and they are maintained by Microsoft. So the agents are located at this path in blue, that is mount batch tasks, startup, working directory. So these agents don't work on their own. They need some sort of uh, configuration to function. And these configurations are provided as environment variables, so these uh, these agents run as daemons, and these daemons are basically the services, and the services need the environment variables. So the agent configurations are stored in the startup working directory and under the DSI folder. What we found was, like for uh, two such agents named DSI mount agent and DSI idle stop agent, they contained the storage account's primary access key. And uh, we reported this again, but why was the environment variable named passwd? Like it could, it could have been anything else like uh, password or storage account password or something else too. So it turns out that the password argument when you supply for that sudo mount command, it can be specified as an environment variable named passwd. So this issue was found while trying to understand how were the previous issues fixed. 
Uh, nevertheless, all the instances of the credentials being logged or stored in clear text were fixed after our reporting. And that brings us to chapter 2. Since credentials being logged or stored in files was fixed and was uh, acted upon after we reported, we had a thought. Okay, are the credentials coming in on the compute instance? And we begin chapter 2. Wait, is uh, that my token? So a user can access a compute instance using Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, uh, Terminal. So all of these are browser-based uh, uh, ways to access. And these requests are basically proxied to the compute instance by a load balancer in between. Uh, note that we, don't, we do not have access to the load balancer's logic here. Uh, the URL will look something like this. So, for example, on a compute instance named AML, which is, resides in a region that is East Asia region, if you want to access the Jupyter Lab on the compute instance, so you go to this URL, and you can go, it, go here from the uh, AML workspace as well. So, uh, you can access the compute instance using Jupyter Lab, and this is how it looks. And this is how the browser embedded terminal looks uh, when you access the CI, the, the compute instance, using Azure ML Studio. Uh, oh yes, uh, the default user, that is Azure user, can assume root privileges without needing a password. So they are already there in the sudoers group. So we'll use this bit later on. So these browser-based terminals can be accessed by a user with the proper role-based access control permissions. And the authentication flow uh, looks something like this. So you have a client which logs into Azure Active Directory and they fetch the Azure Resource Manager token and then they use this ARM token to talk to Azure Machine Learning Service which in turn generates another token that is called the AML token. So all of these are uh, JWTs and then you can perform your, all your AML actions uh, using this token. So all the incoming requests uh, on the compute instance, like from the load balancer, they are received by an Nginx proxy that listens on a fixed port that is 44224. And it has SSL enabled, and the certificates are used from the above uh, highlighted paths. And later, it checks for uh, certain uh, fields that are the subject and the issuer of the client-side certificate that is being supplied, like it demands for a client-side certificate. Later, the proxy uh, checks whether a header named X MS target port separated by hyphens contains a numeric value and if it does not it runs a 401. If it's fine uh, for all the incoming requests with the URLs that contain the Jupyter related APIs the request is upgraded to the WebSocket that's for the uh, terminals and the requests are forwarded on the basis of uh, X MS target port as we see that the variable is set on the uh, first line itself like the proxy host variable is set to 127001 followed by the port and the same variable is forwarded to the proxy pass directive. Basically, an incoming request on the compute instance shall have this header populated. The request is received by Nginx which listens on port 44224 based on the value of the uh, header that is XMS target port. In this case, it's 8888. The request is forwarded to 8888 which is also the default port for Jupyter. So, and the interesting bit here is the uh, logs for any access attempts or any errors that are generated, they are logged in clear text in the default path, in, the, in, 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 a, in a default uh, configuration. So we found, this, uh, we found an issue uh, using our good old friend called TCP dump to view the network capture. So when a user basically uh, terminates a Jupyter terminal, a get request is sent followed by a delete uh, request. So if you notice, there is a token parameter in the URL which contains something like A, E, Y, J and that's like the base64 encoding for double quotes and the open braces. So turns out we have the token of the user uh, in the get request itself. And who did the token belong to? It belonged to the owner of the compute instance. So uh, yeah. While trying to figure out the uh, why did the URL parameter named token contain the credential of the user, uh, it turns out that it's very clear in the documentation. So in the documentation, we see that the authentication token can be provided in three uh, different ways to a Jupyter server. One of the ways is to pass it as a URL parameter, and the other way is using an authorization header or as a password field in the uh, of the login form. 
So the nginx access logs contain the JWT of the user on the compute instance. So after all, these are just credentials stored or logged in files on a, on compute instances. What could go wrong, and what is so risky about it? So uh, this is an example. So developers have been uh, observed to share error or debug logs from their systems on public platforms like GitHub. If they are not quite aware of the fact that these logs at times may contain credentials that too in clear text, that's a silent risk that they're being uh, exposed to. So in this example, you can see there's a request from a developer to another, to another one uh, requesting for the batch error logs, which in our case contained the storage account access key in clear text. Uh, dependency confusion attacks with attacker controlled code executing in your environment, they are known to be exfiltrating credentials after gathering them from environment variables or files. So in this case, uh, this is an example from last year December, where a nightly build of a very popular uh, library called PyTorch was compromised, and the malicious binary would exfiltrate the credentials from files and environment variables. So if an attacker is able to compromise, <coughs> So, <clears throat> so if an attacker is able to compromise a file share, that means that they can trivially compromise the entire storage account. And that eventually means the entire workspace too. So let me show you how. Consider a scenario which might be, like, might, might be highly likely to happen. So a workspace has three data scientists, each having one compute instance. By design, we know that the, each workspace user's files are stored in the same Azure file share. And if an attacker can get hold of a user, which anyway is a very high degree of compromise, or a compute instance which has these, which had these credentials being stored or logged in clear text, or the file share where you have your Jupyter notebooks, scripts that are run on compute instances and compute clusters as well. The entire workspace should be considered to be compromised. Now picture this with a scenario where I as a user could view some other user's JWT token by modifying their scripts. So that's the uh, risk, uh, risky scenario here. And according to the documentation, data stores are supposed to provide a secure uh, way to uh, use your connection information such as a storage account access key. So you don't need to hard code or use these credentials in your scripts. And that's a very cool feature. However, if the, so this is my uh, favorite uh, actor, I would say. So, uh, but if the storage account key itself is being logged in error logs, authorization logs, environment variable files on a compute instance, that kind of creates a difference. And remember, the default user, that is Azure user, can easily assume pseudo permissions. So user privilege is not even a boundary here. Uh, yeah, so now the same issue of credential logging may have been lurking in your environment as a silent threat. So on Valentine's Day this year, I received a CV from Microsoft for a cloud vulnerability, which is not very common. And these instances of credential logging or storage on the compute instance were fixed by the CVE. Now, the uh, JWT of the user is not even observed to reach the compute instance. So forget about the logging part. And the storage account access key is not logged or stored in any of the files. So it all happens in memory, but that's a different story sometime. Some takeaways. So logging and storing of credentials in clear text is unhealthy. So uh, it is very crucial to close loopholes and lower the risk involved in case of a compromise, especially when we have observed in the past with like cloud focused threat actors, they will just love going after credentials in files. So from the design of uh, such environments, we also need to be aware of the associated risks. So a, a user can access the other users Jupyter Notebooks, uh, the compute instances are all in the same workspace. So these are the features of the, uh, I mean, the features of the service and the environment, and one should be aware of the associated risks. Uh, while using open source tools, be it Jupyter, be it Nginx, you need to review the configurations. So uh, forwarding the supplied JWT of the user to the compute instance was still okay. But logging the token, mm, definitely not. Uh, URL parameters uh, shouldn't contain sensitive information as we never know the inline components like we saw in the case of proxies that they pass through 
And this is something that has been highlighted by Daniel Meisler as well, very long ago. Like you never know the inline components when you are supplying some something sensitive in the URL parameter itself. Additionally, uh, developers or users, they need to be aware of the possible uh, security implications that may emanate while sharing error logs on public platforms and the issue of credential leakage can be uh, can turn out to be critical at times, especially when the users are not even aware of the uh, entry point of the breach. So now we embark on the third and almost final chapter of spying the scientist. In Azure Machine Learning, you can create compute instances in virtual networks. So virtual networks, subnets. So you can specify the virtual network and the subnet when you create a compute instance. And this can be a very common scenario that can be observed where the training environment needs access from or to other Azure services through, pri through private networks and not over the internet. A simple environment would look like this. So we have a virtual machine, which is a part of, which is in a VNet in the same subnet. On the same subnet, we have a compute instance. So let's say that the Azure VM on the user's end gets compromised. What could someone do from the Azure virtual machine on the compute instance? So were there any ports open on the compute instance? Uh, let's find out. So we fired up our, <coughs> we fired up our next favorite tool called Nmap and we check for open ports. We come across a port that is 46802. Remember, we have the access of the compute instance as well. So we figure out that there's a process named DSI mount agent that is exposing this port. The process runs as root and I probably know, I probably think you know where this is going, but uh, just hang on. So the process runs as root and if we look up the binary, is it open source like other uh, agents like uh, WA Linux agent or OMI, we don't find any references. And since the binary is not stripped, we have some debug information to figure out how the functions look and if there are any variables and stuff. So we crack open the binary using IDA to understand what is going on. So there's a function called DSI start API service that's already very fishy and it uh, exposes uh, certain endpoints that are uh, defined in these five uh, other lines. And reminder, no authentication is required for network agents and resources to access these APIs and probably do something. So we start taking a look at the different URLs and what do they actually do. So the first one executes the same command on a file. Uh, it's not very interesting. We tried to uh, figure out if there was any uh, command injection that we could possibly do to get a remote command execution, but we didn't. We, uh, so the second one runs the mount operation, which basically um, remounts the Azure file share on the compute instance. The third one uh, helps view the OS image, like the image, like the version of the OS that is, uh, that the CI is running. And the fourth one lets us view the list of services and their statuses as well. This was interesting because examining the uh, services endpoint, one could basically list the status of each installed service on the compute instance. Note that this is happening from the compromised Azure virtual machine in our case. And there's no authentication needed for this. We also see that one could view the logs of any service that is installed on the compute instance. So a network adjacent attacker could basically list down the services installed, view the status, the logs for the service, and this information could aid them in reconnaissance for performing lateral movement within such environments post-compromise. So we had a simple information disclosure bug in our hand and how bad could it be? Just for an example of what all could be exposed from the compute instance, here's a short little demo of what could a network agent tracker really see. While exploring the installed services on the compute instance, we see that Jupyter is installed as a service on compute instances. Now this is across all compute instances that you will create if you're using the OS image of uh, Microsoft. For each service installed, we can view the logs being network adjacent and turns out some commands can be viewed that were executed using the Jupyter terminal as sudo. And folks, uh, this is where I went. Okay, what did just happen? We saw some commands being logged in the uh, Jupyter service logs 
and so this is how it looks like so we have an attacker which get like uh, they get on a virtual machine which is a part of a virtual network on the same virtual network we have a compute instance on the compute instance we have an agent that is dsi mount agent note that uh, customers may not be aware that they like the compute instance has this agent running and the port is exposed i mean not exposed publicly but yeah in the within the uh, same subnet like network adjacency okay so this agent can fetch the system d logs and it exposes uh, an api on port 6802 so this port is actually hard coded in the binary itself so a user if they are using uh, any form of jupiter service it can be jupiter terminal uh, jupiter notebook jupiter lab so let's say if they run sudo cat etc shadow so the command is run as sudo and if an attacker fetches i mean requests for the uh, jupiter logs from the compute instance there is no authentication required here they can view the commands that are executed by the user so this was the this was just a demo for uh, how bad this information uh, disclosure could be and we called this bug mlc and this is uh, hacking the data scientist so on the top we have the compute instance where the data scientist runs sudo cat etc shadow on the bottom we have a network agent an attacker who is trying to fetch the logs so we can see the uh, logs contain the cat etc shadow file uh, cat etc shadow command and now we run the command that is used to mount a file share and the command itself in this case it contains the username and the password as well so that gets logged in the uh, service logs as well although uh, this was just for the demo and if you remember the first episode where we talk about the storage account credentials being uh, logged in uh, error logs or authorization logs they had the command as sudo and it had all the username and the password expanded as well so we reported this vulnerability to microsoft and they promptly fixed it we termed this bug mlc as a network adjacent attacker could possibly see the actions performed by a data scientist without needing any authentication so this was a funny information uh, disclosure bug and now the service uh, doesn't expose the port on all interfaces and can only be reached over the nginx proxy which listens on port 4424 and it requires like a client side certificate as well so that was the closure for this bug some takeaways so at times secret agents may lead to secret bugs and if the users are not aware that uh, aware of the fact that these agents actually exist in their environment they are not aware of the fact that uh, there's an invisible attack surface so vulnerabilities uh, still exist in cloud agents so omicord was one very cool vulnerability and this is one mlc so there is a need for focused uh, threat modeling on the agent features so uh, probably this was not thought of uh, before but now they did uh, i had to put this line so practicing zero trust is hard but uh, the gist of uh, zero trust is do not assume that just because something is already there in environment it should have access to other resources within the same environment additionally uh, deploying training environments in virtual networks is a recommendation from microsoft however we found an edge case where there could be a silent threat uh, lurking in environment now the issue with uh, these issues uh, that i have talked about so far in the first three chapters they are on the cloud provider side and let's say if there is a breach or a compromise that happens by uh, exploiting or using any of these issues uh, where does the shared responsibility model lie so that's an open question for which i probably don't have a good answer as of now okay so this is the final chapter uh, we are in can you really see me so i had to put this here let's say we have a virtual machine and a compute instance they are not on the same network it's just for the uh, box that i put there and we want these azure resources to access certain other services so like these uh, resources on the left on the left they need to access the resources on the right like storage account uh, container registry application insights or key vaults so one of the ways to do this is to hard code the credentials but that's not a recommended way so microsoft recommends using something that is called a managed identity so a managed identity is basically uh, assigning some sort of role or a privilege to a resource so that the resource can talk to other services 
So in this case, you have an application which fetches a token for a resource that they want access to. The managed identity service in this case, uh, yeah. So the managed identity service, it reverts back with the token and using the same token that is shared, uh, the application can perform a request on the resource using the token. So managed identities are of two types, a user assigned managed identity and a system assigned managed identity. So user assigned managed identities can be assigned to multiple resources in Azure. So like they can span across resources and a system assigned managed identity, they are only for the Azure resource uh, that they are assigned to. And uh, by design, they are supposed, uh, like the managed identities, they are supposed to be only used from the Azure resource that you assign the identity to. So using Azure CLI, you can interact with the uh, with Azure Cloud, Azure SDK, and one can sign in using a managed identity on a compute instance. So, uh, yeah. So when one runs az login dash dash identity, I was curious to know what happens uh, behind the scenes. So there is a get request. Uh, so again, we uh, ran TCP dump and we checked for any uh, outbound traffic. So we get this get request with some interesting headers, like a secret header. And the request is being, being sent to a local IP and the port. From the port information, we were able to figure out the process that is listening on this port. That is identity responder D. The process belongs to a service, which is called Azure Batch AI Identity Responder Daemon. It uses a bunch of uh, files, like it fetches its environment variables from a bunch of files, and it's supposed to be responding identities. Interesting. So there are uh, two environment variables that I uh, uh, intend to highlight here, MSI endpoint and MSI secret. A default identity cred uh, credential uh, ID is not the one. So yeah. So while understanding the binary, we found that the binary fetches uh, the secret and the endpoint from this particular file at etc environment.sso. But how does the final request look like? Because we are still talking to the uh, local port, right? So the, sometimes the syslog entries uh, give out a good idea of what a service actually does. So the endpoint in this case is like uh, eastasia.cert api azure ml ms. So it was a little confusing here because the public endpoints were defined in a different file. So that's at mount az mount dot nbvm and we specifically note for the uh, cert URL environment variable. So while analyzing the binary, since uh, this is our game and we set the rules here, we could have, uh, we had options to dump the process, check the logs or reverse the binary. So we went for both, like why not? So the final request looks something like this. So we have a post request with a URI and the host is set to the region, like in this case, it will be like uh, eastasia.cert.api.azureml.ms and in the post requests body, we have a certificate thumbprint followed by the name of the compute instance followed by the resource for which we are requesting for a JWT uh, token. And this post request, like to send this post request successfully from the compute instance, a, a combination of certificate and a private key is used from this path, which is at mount batch tasks startup certs followed by the PEM and the key file. So let's consider a scenario wherein the certificate and the private key have been compromised from a compute instance. Could they be used from non-Azure environments? So the uh, the agent here is identity responder. It talks to the variable, I mean the value of the variable cert URL using a certificate and a private key. And these certificate, like the certificate and the private key, they are defined in the uh, above directory. And in the response, you get a 200 OK with the AML uh, JWT token. All right. So if an attacker does the same from a non-Azure environment, we wanted to figure out are these certificates tied to the compute instance. So turns out the attacker is uh, like the attacker gets a 401 unauthorized. So, hmm. so the assumption that we had like the certificate plus private key is tied to a compute instance. That was true as of now because we were not able to use the certificate from a non azure environment. And we did see that uh, when you create a compute instance, the thumbprint of the certificate is unique per compute instance. So we had this assumption, but we wanted to uh, question the assumption again. 
So now we take a look at <coughs> our uh, good old friend called the <coughs> DSI mount agent. So the DSI mount agent is the same binary. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. So yeah, so the DSI mount agent binary, we have, uh, so this runs as a service and we have a description for this and it fetches the configuration from this environment variable file, which is defined at DSI, DSI mount agent ENB. Okay. So this agent runs as a service on all compute instances. The environment variables look quite interesting. So we have like an encrypted symmetric key, we have a cluster certificate, we have an endpoint. So we have something cool going on and uh, let's figure that out. What does DSI mount agent really do? We haven't talked about this as of now. <coughs> so we see that, so we, uh, <coughs> so we, uh, yeah, I'm back again. So yeah, so the DSI mount agent basically checks and mounts the Azure file share on the compute instance. And it does this every 120 seconds. So it runs as a daemon and, and its job is to basically make sure that the file share is mounted on the compute instance. So it turns out that the agent talks to the, like the value defined in this environment variable, which we will call XDS endpoint, using the same pair of certificate and the private key that we saw for identity responder daemon. Since uh, these are the same certificates, uh, could we still use the certificate to talk to the endpoint from an origin environment? So while examining the outbound network traffic from the compute instance, we were able to fetch a POST request. Upon figuring uh, out how the binary communicates, we craft uh, this POST request. You, have, you, 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 you just have the environment variables there. And this is cool. And the response uh, for this will contain the who am I. And the request type for this POST request is set to get workspace. So this is uh, being sent from the DSI mount agent. Uh, the post request URI and the headers are same from here onwards. So I've removed that for just for brevity. And uh, you can find the uh, the request type defined in another function that is called get workspace info. So this function resides within the DSI mount agent binary. The response contains the metadata about the workspace. This can be considered like the who am I of the AML workspace. So you have resource IDs uh, for the uh, services that you're using the metadata about the workspace. Later, when we restarted the DSI mount agent service, we see this request that goes out as well. Notice uh, that the post body again, this time it is get workspace secrets. And the function name is also get workspace secrets. So we're talking about some secrets. What are these secrets about? In the response, we get the storage account name and, then, and uh, a storage account's uh, encrypted JWE. Since we have the storage account name, uh, it's highly likely that uh, the key is the encrypted storage account's primary access key. But let's find out. So upon un upon understanding how the decryption of this token, like the JWE, happens, here is how it looks like. So we have two environment variables that are AZ AZLS encrypted symmetric key and a private key. These two environment variables are defined in these two files, that is the DSI mount agent uh, and the DSI idle stop agent ENV. Using these two environment variables, you can basically decrypt the uh, symmetric key. And using the decrypted symmetric key, you can decrypt the encrypted JWE that we uh, just saw in the uh, previous slide to get the storage accounts access key from non-Azure environments. So uh, thank you, David. So David helped me with the uh, reversing of this section. Huh. So you have three files certificate, a private key, and the environment variable file. And using these, you can fetch the storage account access key from non-Azure environments. So the certificate is used to talk to the XDS endpoint, and the environment variables are basically used to decrypt the encrypted JWE that we got in the response. So uh, when, let's say, if you come across an instance where uh, your storage account has been compromised or, or your keys have been exposed, the first thing that you do is rotate the storage account key. So we had a question, okay, since uh, let's say if a user comes across a scenario where they have confirmed that there was a breach, 
one of the compute instance was compromised. Some files have been exfiltrated. Now, can I, uh, I'll just rotate the storage account access key and I'll be fine with it. But turns out that's not the case. So we have this uh, AML workspace and we go to the storage account that is associated with this workspace. And on the workspace, we go to the access keys. So we have two access keys. So the primary one is used. So like the first one. <coughs> so we copy this uh, initial value of the, uh, the first uh, primary access key. So on the terminal on the right, uh, this, uh, this is being done from my laptop. So like this is the attacker as of now. So using the POC that I have, I'm able to fetch the uh, storage accounts primary access key. So let's say this has already happened. Now you would just uh, rotate the key and that's exactly what I do. So I've rotated the key and now we'll synchronize the workspace to use this key. So I'll do that from uh, the cloud shell on the bottom left. So we run this key, I mean run this command and then we just wait for some time. Okay, so the keys are synced. And now we have the new key that is up there and we'll run the POC again and we confirm that we can fetch the rotated storage account access key as well. So this is quite persistent already. So is there a way to uh, track the usage of this certificate plus the environment variable combination from knowledge environments? We'll get that, uh, we'll get to that in a bit. So at this point in time, we were kind of happy with the storage account persistence that we found, like you could fetch the rotated storage account access key as well. And the storage account is exactly where you store your ML related entities like data sets, models, notebooks, and whatnot. But were there more open doors? Because we had a lot of agents already running on the compute instance. So the function uh, get workspace secrets, it calls another function that is called generate XDS API request schema. It's not very difficult to figure out what does the other function do. It basically uh, creates the uh, schema of the post request body. So the idea was to list all the cross references to the function which generates the post requests body. So we had a few other uh, candidates like get ACR token. So like that's the uh, token for the Azure container registry, get ACR details, get application insights key and all of these other candidates. So like you saw for the uh, managed identities some time ago, it would have been juicy to have the Azure AD token of any identity that could be fetched from a non Azure environment. So we assigned a system assigned managed identity to a compute instance. And when you assign a system assigned managed identity, you get a principal ID using which you can look up the exact enterprise application that is created for this managed identity. So in this case, the naming is also uh, like fixed. So for uh, in this case, we have the workspace name that is test workspace followed by the type that is computes, followed by the name of the compute instance. In this case, it's called first box. And yeah, so uh, from the properties, you can figure out the application ID and the object ID. So these are just some identifiers for the identity that we have just created. So while exploring one of the agents that is called host tools, we come across a function that is called get AD token, get Azure AD token. So to figure out how does the request body looks like and uh, what are the input parameters that are requested by this function, we debug the agent using GDBJF and we see that uh, there are uh, certain arguments like resource, client ID, API version and some other stuff. So our request now looks like this. So we have the request type set to get AG token and in the request body, we have another JSON which is like uh, we are specifying the resource for which we need the token. And this, uh, like all of this is happening from the DSI mount agent to the XDS endpoint. Uh, in the response, we get the Azure AD token of the system assigned managed identity from non Azure environments. As a bonus, uh, so this was a little out of scope for the talk, but it's a recent development. So we could specify the client ID in the request body parameter and yield the, uh, you could basically fetch the user assigned managed identity token as well. So all of this is happening from non Azure environments. As we saw earlier, a uh, user assigned managed identity can span across different resources and it at times may be overprivileged than what it is supposed to uh, do. So the compromise of the certificate plus the key plus the files containing environment variables can be used to fetch tokens from the non-Azure environment and using the token you could 
uh, possibly move laterally or uh, perform a lot of other stuff. So there was a very cool uh, armory uh, session that was delivered by my friend. Uh, okay, I don't remember the name of my friend, but I'm <laughs> yeah. So it was uh, the the name of the uh, the name of the tool is called Vajra. So uh, you can probably take a look at that. And but why does all of this matter? You are fetching the Azure AD tokens from non Azure environment for some identities. So uh, while skimming through the documentation, we come across this particular statement. So by design, only the Azure resource can use this identity to request tokens from Azure AD. But we are fetching the token from a non Azure environment. So uh, it is not very clear like what is exactly happen. Uh, what is exactly happening? Interesting. So the recap, because there was a lot. If, uh, yeah. So use the DSI mount agent talks to the XDS endpoint using a pair of certificate and a private key. And they can do, uh, they can fetch information about the workspace, the storage accounts, uh, primary access key, the Azure AD token for any managed identity and a lot more. So could an attacker if they have the certificate and the private key compromised. So, uh, yeah. Okay, I have a live demo here. So, just a second. So, did it. Okay. I think this is fine. Is it visible? Okay. <clears throat> hmm. So, we have two directories, system assigned managed identity and user assigned managed identity. I'm doing this from GitHub code spaces, but which is outside the uh, environment that I'm like outside the machine learning environment. So I go to uh, system assigned managed identity and I have uh, three files from the compute instance, like the certificate, I mean the key, the uh, certificate and the environment variable file. So now we will fetch, okay. So let's see. So this POC is very simple. So you can fetch the storage accounts access key or the workspace information or the type of token that you want. So you can fetch the primary access key here and you can fetch the, the information about the workspace. And since this is system assigned, so this will be two. Uh, okay, I think that was, yeah. So this is the Azure AD token of the system assigned manager entity that I'm able to fetch from non-Azure environments. Similarly, if we go to user assigned manager entity, so we again have like a similar uh, configuration. So in this case, so like, okay, let me make that bit clear here. So you have two folders and these two folders have the certificates for two different compute instances. One has the system assigned manager entity and the other has a user assigned manager entity. So you go to user, and do three. You get the JWT for the user assigned managed entity and you can use this token to uh, enumerate the environment, figure out the privileges, move laterally, do a lot of other crazy stuff. And you could actually use the tool named Vajra from my friend Ronak. So I remember the name now. And so I'll just use this here. Go back, slide, okay. Hmm. So since an attacker could do the same and the same could be done from a computer instance, how do the logs look? So, okay. So how one of the uh, CIs ran bad code, our, gel, our jewels are probably stolen too, the workspace was compromised, we can detect certificate and key usage from the logs, right? So let's have a legitimate activity. Here we fetch the JWT of the managed identity assigned to the computer instance. It can be a user assigned on system assigned. And a malicious activity where the certificates are stolen and the attacker is doing the same thing uh, by talking to the XGS endpoint. So we were fooled by looking into why weren't there any logs or anything that we could possibly uh, do some action on. So that was a learning for us as well. So uh, when you diff between the logs generated uh, from the attacker JSON, like the attacker logs and the compute instance logs, so these are the four fields that are different, rest all are the same and the uh, logs don't contain any sign in details. So for, so for example, uh, if you were to detect your certificate usage from a non-Azure environment, you would probably go for something like the IP address from where this request is 
originating. So that info is anyway not there. So almost identical logs, missing location info. And yes, to invalidate the stolen certificate, you basically need to delete the compute instance. So hmm? and the certificate is valid for two full years. Uh, so that adds to the uh, evasive, still the persistence. And if the uh, identity is over permissive, so that can open up uh, avenues of lateral movement or privilege escalation within your environment. So takeaways. You need to have your cloud, so before using any cloud service, you need to have your cloud service logging enabled and in place. You need to understand what is being logged and what is being not logged. So the logging for managed identity usage can be done better. Uh, when you're scoping your identities, be it system assigned managed identity or a user assigned managed identity, you need to strongly follow the principles of least privilege. So as we saw in the documentation, it is mentioned that only that Azure resource can fetch the tokens, right? But we just saw that the tokens can be fetched from non-Azure environments that is outside the resource. Like, so that was the uh, difference there. Uh, yeah, defense in depth uh, with respect to cloud environments is a good win because let's say, uh, okay, I'll be coming to that point in a bit. And threat model environments for possible scenarios of compromise. So uh, this was an assumed breach philosophy that I had applied. Like, let's say your compute instance is breached, bunch of files are stolen, what do you do about it? So, yeah. Oh, uh, how much time do I have? Okay. Uh, so, uh, it was simple, uh, but it was not easy. Here's what else we tried and learned along the way. Failing is hard, we all go through it at some point of time and it's a part of our lives. So, we need to learn from our failures and you need to fail big. I mean, big as in fail good. Uh, so here are some of the things that we tried over a course of three months. Uh, container escape in Azure ML jobs, no cross-tenant scenarios, no dependency confusion, no misconfigurations in Jupyter implementation apart from the JWT being logged in the Nginx access logs. So uh, here, no doesn't mean a no. It may be there, but we didn't find. So it's open to avenues for hack in the box. Maybe you can hack in the cloud. So yeah, I'll go through one of these stories. So in, uh, in Azure Machine Learning, a job can be thought of as a command that you run to in a specific environment. And uh, the command can be basically, uh, I, just, I just think of these as commands, like not specific for machine learning model training or inference. So you can track metrics, logs, output performances and stuff. So the environment in this case is basically a Docker image which contains your dependencies, tools, libraries and other stuff. And the environment can be curated or it can be a custom Docker image as well. So one could create a training job on an automatic compute. So this was still in preview while we were looking at it. And uh, so basically you can specify the uh, G CPU, GPU, and you can specify the virtual machine tire as well. So basically we could create a custom environment with some basic tools installed like curl, wget, ssh. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. So we are able to run commands on a resource that is not created by us. So the questions were, where does the job run in and on what? Can I escalate from the container to the host because I'm specifying the environment as a Docker uh, container? Is the underlying host shared across all other, uh, maybe users or tenants? Are there any nearby hosts to poke around? So to figure that out, we created a job which fetches us a reverse shell. We fetch the IP address of the auto compute modify the firewall rules to let the traffic in, download a metapreter implant on the autocompute container, and we execute the implant. Since we are in a container, we don't see a lot happening. And uh, so we perform a container to host escape. Uh, no, this is not a vulnerability. Uh, we'll go there. Uh, yeah, so this is something that we have been observing from our Docker API based honeypots. And uh, threat actors just love doing this for some reason, I don't know and uh, a little tweaking based on a famous open source tool called uh, Docker Escape tool. So basically, you are uh, elevating to sudo within the, <coughs> the root user within the container namespace. You are creating a directory that is host OS. Then you are fetching uh, the, the UUID of the underlying file system, like these, uh, I'm fetching this from the uh, kernel parameters that are supplied when you create this container. And I'm changing my root directive, like changing the root uh, context to host OS, and then I'm creating an SSH key with an empty passphrase, uh, and I'm uh, saving it at temp test, 
and then I'm modifying the uh, authorized keys on the host to use the private key that I just generated to create an SSH session on the underlying host. So that's how the script is. So once we were on the host, most of our questions were answered. So the job runs in a Microsoft subscription, virtual machines. Can I escalate? Yes, because the containers are privileged. So they run with that dash dash privileged flag. Is the underlying host shared across other users or tenants? No. So that's a good thing. Are there nearby hosts to poke around? So only for the jobs that you create. But we had one last question. Could the hosts be reused? So to verify that we created a malicious job, which basically creates a file on the underlying host. We delete the job from the workspace. Now we create a new job in the same workspace. The expectation is to see that the file is removed, like the file that we created on the host. So that means, I mean, it is supposed to imply that the new job runs on a new virtual machine. But at times the observation was the file existed. So that, so the new job was running on an older virtual machine, which was already infected. We reported this issue to Microsoft and they shared their feedback with us and it clo and they closed it by design. So jobs in, uh, on automatic computes, they are run on virtual machines that are nodes in a batch pool that are unique and isolated per workspace. And each batch pool runs in its own virtual network. So the jobs at times, they can reuse the same batch pool if they are available. And this was our good attempt of understanding how the environment uh, looks like. And this is where we learned a couple of things. We found some bugs uh, that really make the news. These are not cross tenant or cross account scenarios, but these issues are fixed by the cloud provider in your environment and you probably may not be aware of it as well. So we, tr we tried a few angles uh, to our research and we learned along the way as well. But where do we go now? What is, what is the conclusion after all of this? So you need to set up your environment using virtual networks, private links, private endpoints. So now we recap on the issues. Storage account access key being logged in four different places. The JWT of the user being logged in the Nginx access logs. The agent exposing sensitive information in VNet environments. This could still help, like having your defenses in place can help you reduce and eliminate uh, vulnerabilities at times. Following secure deployment strategies uh, can ensure defense in depth and it is quite effective against the silent threats that may, there, that may be there in an environment. Microsoft in fact made it very easy to go secure by default by offering these <coughs> network iso isolation options when you create an AML workspace. And you need to monitor your cloud environments for changes, uh, set up logging using cloud native solutions. You can leverage existing frameworks like Azure Threat Research Matrix or Atlas Framework for your machine learning environments. Uh, yeah, so you need to trust, but you also need to verify like the integrity of Jupyter Notebooks, scripts, models, data sets, if they are being changed or modified from an external party or third party. Examine managed services to uncover silent threats. So these issues are not quite talked about in the public. So this was an attempt at doing that. Yeah, the roles and the policies for your identities should be minimal. So like even if they are compromised, they are not that they, like they don't expand the uh, blast radius or the attack surface. Specifically for machine learning environments, one can leverage the Atlas framework, which is like the adversarial threat landscape for artificial intelligence systems. So think of these like MITRE attack for machine learning. So it also enlists uh, various case studies around uh, simulations and incidents that have been <clears throat> focusing on the machine learning environments, which can which can aid in understanding the threat landscape and uh, acknowledgements, family members, friends, my colleagues, hack in the box for uh, uh, showing up, ZDI for uh, smooth communication of the bugs with Microsoft, and there are a few more uh, bugs in the disclosure pipeline that we are excited about. So stay tuned. Uh, it's not a question of if when like if a vulnerability like this gets exploited. It's a question of when, and we need to really secure our present first. So we have been hacking in the box. Let's hack out of the box, maybe. Thank you. Uh, shout outs to the HIDB team for an experience, for an awesome experience, yeah. Thank you, Natesh. We have time for one question. So anybody have a question? Yep. Quick one before we move on to the next uh, talk. On on your live demo, I I would like you to know the the environment of the that the your computer command 
uh, send the command to the Azure, right? Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. That users uh, that access the Azure resources is the same using the same Azure AD as the the destination or not? So uh, the idea behind that live demo was that I could use the certificate and the private key from a non-Azure environment, although GitHub code spaces are also based on Azure, but the idea was to show that these certificates can be used from outside the compute instance. Uh, right, right, because I, I found the same thing, but if uh, the, 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 the external compute uh, module or anything mm-hmm. uh, is in the same Azure AD as a, Got it. As a result, yes. it can access. Yes. So it's the same, right? Yes. Oh, okay. That that's that's right. I think that's is out of the another actual AD access across the other. Ah, but you need these certificates, like it's irrespective right. of the environment. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Right. Uh, Perfect. So thank you again, uh, Nitesh. Like, that was breaking ML services, finding zero days in Azure machine learning. So one more round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>